All right, so please help me welcome first, the decade-long chronicler of hip-hop community, the CEO of All Hip Hop, Chuck Jigsaw Creekmer. The uber-talented Grammy Award-winning producer, actor, and social justice advocate, David Banner. Yes, a man who was recruited by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. himself as a teenager to join the SCLC, the former CEO of the Hip Hop Summit Action Network, and the former president of the NAACP. Make some noise for the legendary Dr. Benjamin Chavez. And last but not least, give a big Hope Global Forum's welcome to a radio legend, a dynamic entrepreneur, a tireless advocate for women means she's forever that girl, the one and only Angela Yee. Clap it up for him, y'all. <laughs> all right, can you guys hear me okay? All right, well, first of all, welcome. I'm excited to be part of this panel. I was uh, telling Dr. Benjamin Chavis I specifically wanted to do this, this panel to be represented as a woman on this stage when we talk about hip hop. And so that was important to me as we're celebrating the 50th anniversary of hip hop, past, present, and future. Um, I'm from Brooklyn, so <laughs> thank you. You know, we are everywhere. So I just want to start by acknowledging that. And since we started, um, talking about women, let's talk, let's start with you, David Banner, and talk about women's representation when it comes to hip hop, what you saw in the past and how that has evolved. Um, I think it's powerful because in, in society in general, um, the, the women, especially black women, African women, are the cradle uh, of and to society. So the voice, no matter what people perceive it as, good, bad, or, or indifferent, it is important. And the thing that I always tell people is that if it's something that you don't like, it's probably something that can be solved. I remember debating against Congress and telling them if they want us to rap about roses, come to the hood and plant some. <laughs> I can't rap about something that I don't see. And so for, for our women to have their opportunity to speak, it means a lot. And then to have someone like Rhapsody, who's my sister, who is definitely breaking down walls in her own way. And she's standing up in a way like Queen Latifah did. You know, Queen Latifah and Shaquem and them had a lot um, to do with my career at one point. And so to watch her, um, not just as an activist for us as a people, um, but an av advocate for women. Right. You know, to, to see that then and to see where we are now, it's beautiful. That is very um, well said, because I always hear people talk about back in the day, it would feel like it could only be one, it was so much competition, but now it feels like women are really taking over when it comes to hip hop. And Chuck, let's throw it to you. I remember you even wrote an open letter. Oh no, <laughs> don't bring up the open letter. <laughs> but um, I wanna hear your thoughts as the founder of All Hip Hop. Um, you know, I think it's healthy right now. Um, I think we, I would, you know, I'll be honest and say I would love to see more um, representation uh, from, you know, the era, basically the golden era. I would love to see that, like, that level of representation where we saw Missy, we saw Lil' Kim all on the same song celebrating women in hip hop. And um, I think that we have a lot to offer, men and women, and I would love to see the full, you know, diverse, powerful um, collective that we really are. Um, and Dr. Benjamin Chavis, I told you, I was at the first ever Hip Hop Summit Action Network that you did in Detroit. And so I want to flash back to that. And what made you even decide to create something like that, that space? Well, thank you. Um, you know, my background is civil rights. And um, in the early 1970s, early 1980s, there were a lot of player haters on hip hop. Mm -hmm. And so I decided that, look, we should be embracing hip hop. We should be lifting hip hop up. And so I remember, I remember David, you, I was there for that congressional testimony because they were trying to censor hip hop. Mm -hmm. Look, hip hop is a cultural phenomenon that started in the South Bronx among blacks and Latinos. Now, hip hop is all over the world. It's a global phenomenon. But what we have to make sure is that our culture is not only appreciated, 
but we have to make sure we hold on to the economics. Mm -hmm. yeah. I want to thank John Hope Brian for having this uh, forum because a lot of times what happens is we are creative geniuses, but somebody else goes to the bank off of our creative genius. So we got to start bringing that back home. And I'm very, uh, the first hip hop summit uh, was in New York, but we came to Detroit and had five. Mm -hmm. uh, Eminem, you know, used to work with Eminem. Uh, and every city we went into, whether it was in the Northeast, the Southeast, the West, Midwest, there was an outpouring of artists as well as the community at large. And I think that a lot of times people don't uh, understand or appreciate the importance of our culture. You, uh, you, I just want to say something also about women. Look, there would be no hip hop if it weren't for the sisters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A lot of what the brothers do is trying to get the attention of the <laughs> sisters. So, and uh, I remember MC Light, uh, we wrote a book together entitled uh, Fusion, the relationship between civil rights and hip hop. Uh, I just think that the culture is global and the stage is global. Yeah, there are contradictions. Yeah, there are problems. But in all of our cultural form formations, there may be contradictions and problems because there are contradictions in the society that we live in. The culture reflects the social condition, the political condition, the spiritual condition of our people. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> And since we talk about voting, we talk about politics, and we talk about hip hop, those things are very related. Can you think of a time when you felt the influence of an artist when it came to politics? Because that is important, you know. Sometimes artists feel like that's not something they want to touch on, but I think it's, <laughs> David Banner wants to say something now, I'm sure. But sometimes people feel that way, but I think it's so powerful when they do. And I can think of some examples. Um, even seeing Little Baby not intentionally putting out a video and doing a song that really was about what was happening in the moment. Um, we think about people like artists like Marvin Gaye and how influential his music was. Um, can you think of some times when you felt, and David Banner, clearly, you know, that's been... Uh, something that you're known for as well. You're very diverse in your content too. So can you think of times when artists have, have reflected those moments when it comes to politics and influence the masses? Yeah. <laughs> you know, hip hop came out of the ashes, not, you know, quote unquote, ashes of the civil rights movement. And so I think that um, we saw people uh, echoing the sentiments of Dr. King, Malcolm X, Stokely Carmichael, you know, Kwame Touré and, and others. And um, um, those, those artists were people like Chuck D, KRS-One, and, uh, and so on and so forth. In fact, each, uh, you can almost pick rappers who, who were the new version of those, those icons. Um, now it's a little bit different, right? Mm -hmm. So we're not so close to the civil rights movement. We're not so close to public enemies era. And so, uh, I would love to see more leadership um, and representation in hip hop, because everyone's not a rapper in hip hop, right? So we do have folks like Tamika Mallory and, 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 and others who are representative of that, but I think that the artists have matured so much or uh, at least have an, a feeling that they know what they want to say. And Little Baby, when he made that song, I think he kind of backed off of it a little bit because once you step into that, you have to know what you're saying. And that's why having mentors like Dr. King, Malcolm X is, is really important, even Dr. Ben. You know, because I was there at those uh, summits too. Yeah, absolutely. You know. I think our children are a direct reflection of what we did or did not teach them. Mm -hmm. Our parents walked away from the civil rights movement and they went and got money. So our kids watched what our parents did. They set us in front of the TV and in front of video games and they went and got money. So these children turn around and went and got money and then we turn around and criticize them for doing the same exact thing that our parents did? Come on, y'all. And then you expect our children to talk about something you didn't teach us about. And, and, and we reward rappers for being exactly what they are, and then they get on and make money, then all of a sudden you want them to be a political pundit? I don't want them to talk for me. <laughs> they don't know what they're talking about, and they told you they were hustlers. Mm -hmm. So we sit in the crowd, 
and act like we're holier than thou and talk about what rappers should do. Should do. Yeah, some rappers should do certain things, but you all should also stop teaching our children that Christopher Columbus discovered America. That's a lie. <laughs> You should stop, as a doctor, allowing these people to hook us on these drugs that are not good for us. Stop allowing these people to sell us food that's not real. So, so, so for me, for you to turn around and put pressure on rappers, and then if they do, do decide to be political, you don't reward them for that, and you don't pay them for that. So it don't make sense. So if you want these children to do something, show them how it looks to do it and be successful first, my opinion. <laughs> well, David just gave all of us a good example of the power of hip hop, the power of articulation, the power of our poetry, the power of our art, the power of our dance, the power of our movement. In the civil rights movement, C.T. Vivian defined movement as people movement toward attain a goal. I want to give hip hop credit for something that nobody hardly gives hip hop credit for. Hip hop was the first cultural phenomenon that actually transcended race in America. Transcended race in America. Mm -hmm. And we're not hardly giving credit for it because today we have a serious racial problem in America. Today we have a serious problem of anti-Semitism in America. Today we have a serious problem of Islamic phobia in, in America. We got all these divisions. But one of the things about hip hop, it brings people together across racial lines, across the division, across urban versus rural and suburban. And now even globally. I was in China, man, I saw some young Chinese with uh, dreadlocks <laughs> on the one and twos doing flips on the one and two. <laughs> because they identify with the trends that we set here. And a lot of times, uh, my last point, please do not underestimate the power of hip hop culture. And you're right, they come to the artists every four years when it's time for an election, mm -hmm. and they wanna use the artists to get out to vote. But after the election goes, sometimes they get into places of elected officials and, and disdain the culture that gave them the opportunity to be elected in the first place. Then turn around and put RICO laws on the same <laughs> artists that helped Thank them you. get in and put Absolutely. them in jail. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm, mm, mm. So, you know, I, I'm going to speak to you as an uh, OG. I'm an original gangster. <laughs> and proud of it. Hey. Well, since we are in Atlanta and you brought up the RICO, I want to ask about the art form and the lyrics, and lyrics being used in this trial right now that's going on. We see with Young Thug, we see with YSL, the judge has said that they can use um, lyrics from the songs in the trial. So I wanna get your take on what you think about lyrics being used against artists. And then we've heard Fat Joe said 95% of what he says isn't true in his music. Uh -huh. But I wanna see what you guys think about that um, in an honest way. First. No, I went first last. <laughs> they, they might shut it down if I go first. No, go ahead. No, go ahead. Why, don't, why, why don't they convict white males for making horror movies? White, white, white men can make, uh, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger can blow up half of the universe and go and be governor. Why do they take that to be art? They use, it, they use any example at, at, or any situation that they can to lock up. America was based on free or cheap labor. And the only way you can have free or cheap labor is to lock people up. Okay, so they try to find any kind of way. It's art. And I told my brothers, I said, y'all better stop saying you're keeping it real because they are going to find a way to lock us up. It's just art. And even if it's, even if it's not, do you mean our First Amendment rights are not good enough for us to talk about our past experiences? Mm -hmm. because, because, because what I told somebody, I remember debating about Tupac. I said, what you don't know and what statistics can't show you is what I didn't do because of that song. Maybe I didn't do something wrong because of Tupac's anger. Maybe because he made the song, I didn't have to do it, but you won't see that because you don't see the other aspect of hip hop. Mm -hmm. 
It's an art. We are artists. But what they do is they paint a picture of, of, of black males and black females every day. And then what they do is they pay to in, impoverished people to continue to push that narrative. And nothing is wrong with that narrative at any point. It's just the fact that it needs some balance. So why don't they push that? And why do they convict the artists and not convict the white men who are in those record companies pushing the same thing? So if you're going to convict, convict everybody if that's what you're going to do. But they won't do that because that's their nephews, uncles, aunts, cousins, grandfathers. You know, I, I'll just ask you all, man, just allow these children to express what they're going through. They're going through some pain. And, and everything don't look the way that it looks for you. And just allow them to be what they are as artists and do their art. That's what I said. Our, <laughs> yeah, I, you know, um, first I just say amen to what the two brothers just said, Angela. We actually had hip hop summits on financial literacy, mm -hmm. which connects to what John Hope is doing with this conference. And young people were, it was called Get Your Money Right. And we had over 70 of those summits in all the major cities in the United States, in Toronto, Canada, as well as in Johannesburg, South Africa. Because unfortunately, the school system does not teach uh, literacy, financial literacy. I don't teach literacy either. Because <laughs> um, folks come out and can't pass the third grade reading test. Yeah. But my point is, this RICO thing, I, I take that very sensitive. Because some of you know, I spent most of the 1970s yep. in prison unjustly in my home state of North Carolina for fighting to get the right for black kids and white kids to go to school together, the Wilmington Tent. And a young brother who was a great basketball player, Michael Jordan, was in junior high school from Wilmington, North Carolina. And we, you know, I, was, I said, is, people used to ask me all the time, man, uh, uh, being in the movement, you have to pay a price. No, you pay a price for not being in the movement. Yeah. You know, you pay a price for not standing up. You pay a price for not speaking out. So this RICO thing, you know, it's like Governor DeSantinus. <laughs> and I said it right. The Satanists <laughs> in Florida <laughs> wants to ban books, yeah. wants to burn books, wants to deny the culture, wants to, want to try to say that slavery was a benefit uh, to us. Mm -hmm. We know that's a lie. And he's the governor now running for president. Yeah. And so we got to steer our nation, our world back to some reality, some truth. And I agree. I do not think that a RICO statute should be used uh, to deny people their First Amendment rights or to speak out and stand out with language that may be offensive, but the offensiveness of the language reflects the offensiveness of the social condition mm -hmm. that the artists come from in the first place. Yeah. I'll just, you know, um, just mic check. Um, Ice T one time said, Ice T said, freedom of speech, but just watch what you say. <laughs> <laughs> and that's an album title. And I never forgot that, you know. So, one thing, you know, during this Hip Hop 50 celebration, I saw an individual who I've known over 20 years. I saw him at a concert, and we shook hands and exchanged pleasantries. And then I saw him at another one. And then I saw him at another one. And on the third one, he gave me, a, he gave me his card. And it said all the pertinent information, and it had my name on the back, my government name. And he said, if you get into trouble, use this. And I realized that he had been attending all the hip hop shows and all the concerts and things as we celebrated Hip Hop 50. So when I'm driving and there's an officer behind me, you see the officer and you slow down or you do the right moves and make sure you don't speed or whatever. I think that hip hop has, far, has lost sight that we are still in the crosshairs. We are still targeted unfairly. We are still being looked at and the things that we, um, used to take, um, that used to be in our DNA, um, has, I think we've lost track of that. I think we knew this innately um, after the Civil Rights Movement, after even Big and Pac, you know, we knew that Pac was being followed every step of his career. And we have to, again, like uh, David said, we've got to teach this to our young people. And back in the day, 
We had black executives at these companies. We had folks in leadership positions on a corporate level who did artist development or may have, they may have different checks and different balances even within the culture. And now we don't necessarily have that. We have social media. We have a really a true digital wild, wild west environment. And we have got to get back to some really core common sense values and understanding that we're still being targeted. And that's not likely to stop anytime soon. And you know, as we're talking about being targeted and we're talking about financial literacy, um, and we're talking about what's happening now with streaming, I wanna read um, DJ Scratch had wrote on his page, he got 496,000 streams for the year, and he said almost half a million people stream my single, they'll pay me around $1,500. Right, so that's the numbers um, that you see with that. And so what are some things, because I feel like this is something that everybody's been addressing. You know, we all got the end of the year, like what we did on, what we've been watching and listening to on YouTube, what we've been listening to on Spotify, but the artists are not being compensated fairly for all these streams. And so this is something that is newer, but what are some things that have to start to happen now to push back against these corporations because artists are not being compensated and um, we have AI, which that's gonna be a whole new thing uh, that's gonna happen with people's intellectual properties. So this is something that we have to really be very uh, cognizant of and aggressive about now. So what are some things that can be done? Well, we had this conversation backstage a little bit. We have billionaires in hip hop. We have very powerful people right now now, again, it's not as simple as just collecting your coins together or your systems, but I do think that there has to be some sort of conversation around the power inequities as well as developing systems within our own culture and making those actualized in real life. Um, and again, it's, hard, it's easy for me to say that because I'm not one of those people and I don't understand perhaps what it takes once you get up to that billionaire status, when you start messing with Spotify's money or you start messing with uh, YouTube's money, what, what that translates into. But I do think we have to get, we have to hold the line. And that's a term that I learned from um, an individual. And I think that at some point we have to learn to hold the line. <laughs> Your turn. All right. Um, <laughs> this is the truth. I say this all the time to, to, to people, until we understand this, it'll never change. White supremacy pays. If you go along with the system, it pays. So we're gonna have to show these children and show artists that it pays to do the right thing. Instead of guilt tripping and tell people you should do the right thing because it's the right thing to do, that does not work. Yeah. When I go and lecture to these kids, I'll ask the teachers, if you had a choice between selling dope and working at McDonald's, which one would you do? And the kids say, well, I, mean, and the I mean, and the teachers would say, well, working at McDonald's, you a damn lie, and that's why these kids don't listen to you. If these kids stand out on the corner and they have some good dope, it's gonna sell. If they go to college, what they are gonna have is a bill. It's not promised to them that they're gonna do well, and until we stop, acting like this system is broken and that it doesn't compensate people for doing the wrong thing, these kids are going to do what it takes in order for, they tell you all the time, I'm going after the bag. Well, what if the bag meant supporting your, your, your community or being a teacher? Why are teachers broke? I don't understand that and then wonder why the educational system is broken. Can I, can I give y'all an example of something? When I said make them girls get down on the flow like a flow like on the flow like a pimp, I made millions of dollars. <laughs> watch this and watch how uncomfortable mm -hmm. some people get. You ready? Since this is about hip hop 50. They gave us Obama like, like it was gonna stop the fight, like it was gonna stop the cause. My folks still scraping trying to find them some socks and drawers and something to eat. The IRS is coming, so I'm back on these beats. Barack push hope, Reagan push dope. Clinton pushed something down a young gals. And since we talking about throats, white folks, what you know about ropes? White folks, what you know about trees and men swinging from them that look like me? How they say that don't affect us? Tuskegee, how you let them infect us? 
okay, you want kids to rap, but if they rap like that, they broke. So before, before you judge the community, and I, I want to say one, one other thing, something I always notice, I was like, bro, I eat very healthy. Mm -hmm. Why don't healthy companies and why the companies don't come and give the same type of promotional deals that's selling alcohol to my community or, mm -hmm. or, or, or selling something yeah. that will keep us sick? Yeah. But the thing that I will tell you, it's on you. It's on the general public. It's not on the artists. The artists are going to follow whatever you all demand. And if you demand sickness, they're going to continue to spew sickness. All right. <laughs> yes. All we have to do now is just say amen. <laughs> <laughs> you know, David, uh, thank you for your um, authentic poetry, thank you. for your commitment to the craft that transforms the way people think. If you transform the way people think, you will transform the way people act. And I believe that uh, our society here in America, as well as the global, but particularly in America, that considers itself the richest, the most technological advanced nation in the world, but yet, there's a tendency now to go backwards, not forward. And going backwards means, yeah, you're going to start not only censoring hip hop, locking up rappers, but on the other end, you see mass exploitation of people rather than mass empowerment of people. In a lot of our major cities, you in Brooklyn, you know the gentrification is going on in all of our places. Uh, where we used to live, we can't afford to live there now. You know, been pushed out. So why am I bringing these up to a hip hop discussion? Because again, our culture, our songs, uh, what we meditate about, what, what makes us happy, what gives us joy, has to be about not only learning the finance and not only learning the economic development, but how we are committed to one another. Mm -hmm. You know, how, how we forge unity to achieve a sense of purpose. Mm -hmm. You remember when there was this whole thing about East-West conflict between uh, the artists. And we found out that the conflict was artificial. You know, where uh, uh, East Coast artists could go to the West Coast and do well, or West Coast artists could come to the East Coast and do well. But it had to defy what was being put in place. So my simple point is this. We have nothing but more opportunity today not to repeat the past, but learn from the past. And as we learn from the past, we can keep pushing forward. I, I'm, I didn't come here tonight to be a pessimist. I didn't come here tonight to, think, to make you think that the situation is hopeless. It is not hopeless. God, is, we are a blessed people. We're not cursed people. Mm -hmm. But we have to understand our blessings. We have to understand the creative genius that has been deported and parted and parsed out among amazing people. We're not the only creative people in the world, but sometimes our particular creativity gets criminalized, uh -huh. gets demonized, gets put down, and sometimes even snuffed out before it, it, it is allowed to glow. So we've got work to do. And I just want to thank again John Hope Bryan for allowing this great conference to have this aspect, uh, Angela, because to me, how our young people think is eventually how they will become. Right. And we are definitely talking about hip hop being 50 years old, and everybody on this stage has been a part of hip hop for so long, and by the way, since you brought up the working out you've been doing, the water you've been drinking, <laughs> right? Look at how amazing everybody up here looks. Thank you, thank you. 
And the fact that we have all been still able to, I know there's ups and downs, but be in this business still, producing, you know, making movies, doing music, being at, going back to school, doing that work, and that allhiphop.com still exists. Chuck, that you and Greg, who have thank started you. that, are still together 25 years later. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. And you can know, I say something about you for your strength, mm -hmm. for you being able to stand up on your own? I know it's not easy. One of the things that people don't talk about, sister, is that our mistakes, we have to live through them in public. Wow. And for you to stand and be successful, this is, it's different to stand when stuff starts going bad, but you stood in a time when you were at the top of the game. And for you to stand and continue and fight your way through, I know that you are here to, to talk to us, but I want to also honor you, and you are part of hip hop too. Uh, <laughs> But honestly, like it is, it is, and you're right, it is such a blessing for us because hip hop is something that people thought wasn't going to be around, that it wasn't going to last, that people wouldn't be able to monetize and to see where we've come and the opportunities that we have. And you know, it's way up, just like my show. And so <laughs> I just feel, um, you know, that we, we definitely want to make sure that we celebrate that, but we are still just talking about a lot of things that we need to make sure that we're aware of. And I think this was a great opportunity for us to have this open discussion, which is what I really wanted, but to also celebrate 50 years. Yes. Absolutely. And before we, I know we're in Atlanta. I just want to give a shout out to T.I. <laughs> he just opened up a housing development. Yes. And even though he opened up a housing development, it got very little press. Mm -hmm. It got very little media coverage. But if he went out and stuck up somebody, that would have been on the front page. Mm -hmm. So we got to make sure that when the artist does go back, you know, the theme of the Hip Hop Summit Action Network was taking back responsibility. Mm -hmm. right. And I was so pleased to see brothers and sisters of all ages in the culture give something back to those communities from which they emerge. In fact, this is a, a factual statistic. Hip Hop artists, recording artists, give back to their community more than all the other genres of music put together. Mm -hmm. But they're not, giving, they're not giving credit for their benevolence. They're not giving credit for reaching back and giving back to the community. And we certainly should do that. Yeah. Well, listen, hip hop is 50. Chuck and I are tired. We said that back then. We were like, it's getting late. Absolutely. But no, thank you guys so much. And again, thank you to Chairman John Hope Bryan for having this summit. I was here last year. I know I'll be back again next year. So let's continue to enjoy the rest. I think we have more things happening tonight, right? Yeah, can I tell yeah. you one more thing? Performance. One more thing? Okay, a performance. All right. Yeah. But well, thank you guys. All right. All right. Give it up for this amazing panel right here.